so much. Good to see you tonight. Who are y'all? I haven't y'all used to come here a long time ago, didn't you? <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 2 in your Bible tonight, if you have them, we are entering a new heart, the new EKG, as we're doing a series entitled God's Spiritual EKGs, and uh, looking at different individuals' hearts in the Bible, and uh, how they were, uh, what kind of hearts they had, and uh, tonight we look at another new one. We finished, uh, let me just finish. Uh, Solomon. Night. Solomon, yeah, you're right. Because they depressed me last week, reading about yeah. all the women and yeah. trying to, in my mind, figure, God, wait a minute, why, how did you allow all of this? But anyway, Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, going just to, to verse 2, and the Bible says it came to pass in the month of Nisan, uh, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? Seeing thou art not sad. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. We're introduced to a new heart tonight found in verse 2. And tonight I just bring to you the sorrowful heart. And, of course, Nehemiah is the individual that had a heart that was heavy enough to actually cause it to affect his countenance. And so he had a heavy load. He was carrying a heavy burden. And we'll see what that burden is before we finish this message. Let's pray. I, Heavenly Father, again, we come before you. We're so grateful to you for another day, another opportunity to serve, another opportunity to hopefully be a blessing to someone. Some we emailed today, some phone calls made, and Lord, uh, we just want to serve you. We want to be the best we can be for you, and you deserve our very all as well as our best. And uh, we thank you for, uh, Lord, this church. Thank you for those who are here tonight. And I pray as we study around your word, I pray that you would feed us, that you would give us uh, some help and some truth. That might be we could leave here with tonight that would encourage us in some way. And uh, as always, Holy Spirit, I'd be foolish to preach without thee. So touch us, give us your liberty as we speak and teach. And we'll thank you, we'll praise you in Jesus' name we ask. And all of God's church and people said, Amen. Dr. W. W. Landrum made a statement in a book, and this is what he said. A Christian should have a heart. 20, listen to this, 25,000 miles in circumference. Anybody get that? Anybody get circumference? Think about that. What is he saying? He said, if anybody has big hearts, and I'm talking about in every way, the Christian and the Christian life ought to possess a super big heart. We ought to be big hearted toward people, should we not? We ought to love people. Do you love people? Well, a few of you do out there tonight, but most of you didn't. But anyway, but uh, but we ought to care enough to where our hearts are large. We have the capacity to love. Why? Because he's in them. And when you got Jesus inside you, and you do through the Holy Spirit, uh, the Bible tells in the book of Romans that he, through the Holy Spirit, has shed his love through us unto others. So it's not about you. It's about the Holy Spirit in you that can love anyone regardless of who they are, and by the way, whatever they may be guilty of doing against you. And we need to understand that. So I, I concur with W.W. W. Landrum in the statement that he made. So tonight we're going to find someone with a super big heart. So much the so that because of the news that he hears, it affected his heart to such a degree 
that even those that aren't even saved could tell there was something wrong with them. Anybody here ever notice uh, people's countenance? My wife knows me pretty good. She'll see when I'm sometimes down, and I don't get down a whole lot, trust me, but uh, I do, and I've had my moments. But anybody, anybody here get down? You know what I'm talking about? Enough to where it can affect your count. I'll tell you what, I told you Sunday, man, reading and studying this past sermon I did last Sunday bothered me. Oh, got a hold of me. Uh, and in fact, we were with Harold and Ann last night, and uh, as we were talking, he texted me, actually called me today, and I couldn't take the call. And uh, he said, Bill, he said, you know, one of the things we were talking about at the table last night was the top 100 churches in the 60s and 70s, largest churches in America. Well, the greatest church in that book of Talman Townsend was not Jerry Falwell, not Townsend, not uh, First Baptist Church of Hammond, but it was a church called Akron Baptist Temple and uh, had a phenomenal pastor. They were the largest church in America at that time. And he just shot me a note. He said, I, I was intrigued by some of the things you preached Sunday as well as what we talked about last night. So I started doing some searching. And he found the same thing I did. But he found Akron Baptist Temple in Akron, Ohio. You got, you got family in Ohio. I know that Akron's probably not anywhere near. How far? Sister. She lives near she, Akron. Near Akron? Yeah. Okay. Then she would be familiar with that church many years ago. She's been there most of her life. Everybody knew Akron Baptist Temple. But anyway. Uh, thousands, maybe 10,000 back then, uh, before anybody even knew what 10,000 was in Sunday school. Now it's Sunday school, by the way. It's not church. They did more for church. They only counted back then Sunday school. But uh, today it's been looted, it's empty, and been for sale for years. And uh, so another one bit the dust. And uh, so I thought about that interesting. But you can sometimes, maybe, I don't know about you, you can read something or you can so be concentrated on something that it can truly affect your mind, and from your mind it goes to your heart, to where you, you feel a little down, so to speak. And uh, so that's exactly what you find with the man tonight, Nehemiah. Nehemiah had been serving this king, and by the way, in order to have his job, you got to understand, they went through a lot of scrutiny, uh, because number one, he was a Jew. He was not one of their own. And yet he was a Jewish man that no doubt Artaxerxes trusted, and this is a true statement, with his very life. That's the reason he was serving him. Everybody understand that? In other words, nothing passed to the king unless it first passed to Nehemiah. Are you with me? In other words, he never drank a cup out of that on one side of that cup Nehemiah did not taste first. So there's two things going on there when you really think about the greatness of Nehemiah. Nehemiah trusted God enough to keep him alive so, because anybody came to poison the king, first person going to die and going to be observed first to die would have been the, the cup there. Does that make sense? So he tasted the food. He tasted the, the wine or any liquid beverage that would come to the king. And if it was bad, he would be the one that would get the jest immediately, and it was only after he had done it for a while and tasted it, nothing happened to it would the king then proceed to drink or eat that which it was. So keep in mind, would you not say the king had to trust him emphatically, tremendously? At the same breath, Nehemiah had to be trusted completely and trust in God completely that the job God had allowed him to get into, which God was going to use. I, I don't know if y'all, do y'all get excited about how you can sometimes reflect back in your life and see the hand of God all over it in different places, the way a certain person met you, a certain call came to you, and had it not been for spirit. I, for example, I, I'll give you an example of how I got in the valley. I don't know that I've ever told you the specifics about it. I had candidated for two other churches, one in Atlanta, Georgia, and one, again, never asked anybody to put my name nowhere. It just, just came my way. And I couldn't figure out, well, who do I know in Atlanta, Georgia, for crying out loud? This is a pretty big church, running about 500, and they had 560-some students in their Christian school back then. Big, huge school. And uh, so we went down, spoke at, at Christmas, <laughs> and I got busted by my deacons. But anyway, it sometimes happens. Uh, only one day he came he said, you candidated this weekend. I said, no, and I, I told him the truth. I didn't. They wanted to come down and preach for him just to hear me, okay? 
And so I did. Spoke in Sunday school, several things. But anyway, had people say, great service, great church, great music. Good night that they had. They had an orchestra back when there was no orchestras. But anyway, going down for that. And then, so evidently, they must have liked something. And they invited me back for another weekend. And this time I was going to be with a pulpit committee. So I went back a second time. And I really thought that was the church. And there was an answer that the deacons gave to me. It wasn't. They didn't close the door. I closed the door, shut it down. Because it just had peace about it because of one statement a deacon made. And so anyway, at the same time, I get another call from Danville, Virginia. Another pretty large church. They were on television. And uh, I really liked that church. I really liked the pastor there. But I'm going to show you how the hand of God works and moves. Now, here I'm traveling and doing this. I know God's getting ready to finish me in West Virginia. I already knew it, all right? Uh, but the whole deal was this. Had I been able to be found easily where I was, I'd moved to. We had moved out on a 500-acre farm out in Athens, West Virginia. We were no longer living in Princeton, just a little cop skin of a job, all right? It'd be like Stewart's Draft going to stay. Okay, about the same distance, give or take. But we were on a farm. I wanted to be out and what I didn't like we were living in the city and so forth. But anyway, I mean, all sorts of work. The guy that I didn't even know was recommending me here had put my name in with a couple deacons over there and a trustee. And they were trying, they'd been trying to reach for me, reach, reach out to me for several months, according to them. And they never could find the right Bill Johnson. They talked several Bill Johnsons in Princeton, but it wasn't me. And so finally, uh, I, I don't know if I don't know if it played out that they they contacted Danny and then Danny contacted my parents and said, Do you have Bill's number? He must have moved. And they said, oh, yeah, he moved about a year ago. And so anyway, that's how it all happened. So here's the deal. Had God not been orchestrating so many of those steps for me, I've never ended up here. And I do know I'm where I'm supposed to be, where God wanted me many years ago even, for that matter, in 1990. And I, I stand amazed. I don't know about if y'all are that away, I mean, I know I'm moving, trying to move in the will of God. Y'all may not be in the same depth. Uh, uh, that I would be being a preacher to make sure I take the right church. But uh, it's it's amazing to me. Think about Nehemiah. How did he get where he was? Who do you think placed him there, for crying out loud? See, when we read our Bible, we don't think about some of these kinds of things. God placed him there exactly where it needed to be. Let me ask you a second question. Do you think it was an accident and just, oh, it just happened? that he had just got the worst report about Jerusalem any man could have heard. Why was he sad? He wasn't sick. He wasn't sad because he was going through trouble, turmoil. It had nothing to do about him. It had to do about God and God's people and God's particular city, Jerusalem. Think about it. Everybody, everybody getting to what I'm saying? Do you not see how God orchestrated every minute detail so that he could be exactly where. Hey, did he not do it throughout the Bible? Esther! Esther, she won the beauty pageant for crying out loud. That's exactly what was, that's how she got where she was. Think about it. And for such a time as this, she said, she knew God planted her there. God placed her there. God put her there. Don't that excite you? Sometimes different people that you meet and you can reflect and say, hey, I'd have never married my wife had not been for that. Okay? Had she not came home one weekend, one homecoming day, I'd never met that girl right there. Never. That's the first time I'd seen her in church. I she was there. in bad shape. She was I wicked was as a devil. I never did. Well, <laughs> keep in mind, I was downstairs and, I, and that was true. I was there. I was on staff there, but um, I was in junior church all the time. And uh, we we didn't we didn't finish at twelve o'clock noon. We always finished about twelve thirty. Sometimes went to a quarter to one back in those days. And uh, then I had to bring up the kids. And so I don't know why I never saw her, but that was the first time I ever saw her. And she just came in from college that particular time. Okay, and that's when I, hmm, I ain't never seen her before. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, I love it when God does and shows us what He is doing behind the scenes. And you can see it throughout the scripture, constantly and continually. Daniel, same thing, okay? Uh, in positions God allowed him. Uh, think about Moses, for crying out loud. 
look how gosh, look how God orchestrated the, the pathway of Moses over and over and over again. Okay? Uh, <laughs> this is not a good one. I would not want to be him even though God was in it to the T. How would you like to have been Joseph? Think about that. Even prison. Even the butler and the baker and the candlestick maker. <laughs> That's not it. But anyway. Uh, but I'm just simply saying, do you not get blessed when you read something like that in the Scripture? How our God is so perfect in every detail that he performs and that he works and that he plans and that he does. Well, tonight we're looking at a real big-hearted man. His name is Nehemiah. Nehemiah has a big heart because his heart is described by not him, but by God, as the king sees his countenance and he says, but it is but of sorrow of heart. He knew he was burdened about something. He was bothered by something. And he's the fourth heart that we've looked at or begin looking at tonight. We've looked at three hearts. First heart, hard heart. Second heart, proud heart, that of Uzziah. Third heart was finished last week, was a, for want of a better word, a turned heart, which would have been the heart of Solomon, turned away from God, horribly, horrendously. And uh, how God put up with some of what Solomon even did beyond me. But as I've said something to someone today, I'm amazed he's put up with me. And uh, you ought to be amazed too. Tom, you particularly ought to be amazed. Me. But uh, so we're going to look at another spiritual EKG. And all the hearts thus far have been hearts that were experienced what I would consider serious major EKG problems. Would you not say a hard heart would be a major problem? Would you not think a proud heart that had no reversing going back would be a difficult and a turned heart completely away from God under idols and false gods and his women and all that kind of a thing. But tonight, a little bit better. Tonight, it's kind of hard. I would look at God I could maintain and have, even though it would not be easy. And that's kind of hard Nehemiah had. What kind of hard did he have? He had a sorrowful heart. Why? Because he had a burden. An extreme burden for his people and for a city called Jerusalem. And uh, we ought to have, we ought to want to have this kind of a heart tonight. Amen? A sorrowful heart. All of us need to have that kind of heart. Uh, I don't know that I would want another week like last week studying the, the messages and reading the testimonies of these pastors out of the ministry today, one after the other. And, and, and they're just disbelieving God completely. Uh, the, the title that they gave themselves, what did I tell you Sunday? They're called uh, Agnostic Atheist. So I did some research this week on that term to, to know that I, what I'm talking about when I deal with it. But uh, I now know. They, they say, we don't believe there is a God, but because of our experience and because of where we came from, there just might be one. <laughs> Basically what they mean. It's sort of stupid and dumb, isn't it? If they're wrong. <laughs> and they are wrong. But anyway. Um, so, tonight we look at uh, point one of the song part. First thing I'll share with you that the scripture tonight is given to us as we read Nehemiah is the condition that is shared with him that brings about the sorrow of heart and spirit. What's the report? Look at chapter 2, verse 1 again. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, the wine before him. I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time. So there's something's changed. And in order to know what the change is, you must go back to chapter 1. All right? So everything takes part and place in the Spirit of God giving us chapter 1 of what leads to him experiencing chapter 2, verse 2, that he had a sorrowful heart. Well, what in the world's going on? What's the first concern that he has? What's caused the sorrow, the burden, uh, the change completely of a fallen countenance? No more joy, no happiness appearance on his face. And the king immediately recognize something is wrong with him. Now, how would you like to have been him? Now, think about this now. What was his job, his occupation? To protect the king from poisoning. And you had somebody going to serve you, and he's serving him now. 
And the minute he starts to serve him, King goes to his face and says, well, I ain't never seen that face before. That looks a little suspicious. But you understand what I'm saying? I mean, the king could have said, hey, out of my presence, you're dead and gone. I'm not trusting you anymore. Because he had never been like that before. He could have been, he could have been seen sorrowful because he had poison and he knew he had it. Do you understand how the king could have fought in this process of time? And thank God that he did. But his concern was about two things. First off, he was concerned about a people were in reproach. All right? Did you, did you see that? By the way, I haven't got to that verse, have I? Here's the verse. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3, And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity, they're in the province. Remember, Artaxerxes released a certain number of Jews to go back to Jerusalem. And they were to go back and rebuild, but the problem was they didn't build anything. They actually got back there, and the history tells us that they struggled. They suffered hunger, uh, privation. They suffered difficultly, with difficult times because they didn't have famine. The city's been destroyed. They're going back to nothing more than a bunch of broken walls and buildings. There's nothing there. And so you can understand their dilemma when they get back. No jobs. There wasn't any money. Where are they going to get any money from? And so you got to understand, it wasn't the best of situations for the Jewish people. And so this group that was in captivity now is in Jerusalem. Notice, when, when the report comes back to him, he wants to know immediately how the people fare. How, how are my people? He has a compassion, a concern, a sorrowful heart, because he cares about his people. Should we not as well today? Does it, does it, I mean, how many, how many does it, in this room, does it really truly bother to see the direction of our country? I can't get away from it. It bothers me. Terribly. Burdens me terribly. Because I know there's not much I can do about it. You know? Other than I know God's in control in charge. Amen? And if it's going a course in a direction, he's not causing it, but he is permitting it under his auspices and his attention. Does that make sense? And that's the only encouragement I find in today's day and time that we're living in. And so he saw they were in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. I find it amazing how many times when you talk about, well, when God talked about his beloved city, Jerusalem, how often, always almost, the walls and its gates are mentioned. When I went to Israel, they gave me a, a huge photograph of a panoramic view of the entire city. And uh, I don't know, I guess most of you know it has 12 gates, okay? And uh, you can only get in a panoramic view so many of those gates. But man, it is a breathtaking, beautiful place from a distance from Mount of Olive. Gorgeous. I know why Jesus went there. Because he could see everything that he was praying over, praying for, and where he knew he would end up. Ending having his life taken from him on Calvary's cross and so forth and so forth. But it's beautiful. It really is. If you get a chance or ever get there. But they have pictures of it that's worth looking at. But, so, he was in great despair. He was showing his despair. Notice the word great affliction. The Hebrew word simply means misery. Death of misery. Despair. So here is a city that was so once blessed by God. Now, instead of enjoying the blessings of God and the mightiness of God's pouring out his spirit and his power, even on Jerusalem at one time, certainly he protected them time and time again, all of a sudden, it's nothing but destroyed, broken down, and nothing but heaps of rubble. Think about it. And it broke literally Nehemiah's heart. So he says they were a great despair or misery. Then there was something else he said. He said they were also in great reproach, a great disgrace. When you think of somebody being reproached, is that not what it means? It means to be disgraced. Uh, it means to be somewhat in humiliation. Uh, not because you're humble, but because you've been humiliated. All right? You got to understand, this was considered the city of the Jewish people. This was the city of God. Songs write about the city of God. Are you with me? He's not talking always about the new Jerusalem, even though he does have some songs about it. But he's talking about the old Jerusalem. It was a beloved city. It was God's choosing, God's place. And everything tied with it was about that. 
And so here, people that had plenty at one time, before captivity, before Babylon conquered them, now are in absolute abject poverty. Think about that. It's shocking. So when does that happen in America? And it one day will. Someday. Uh, maybe not in our day. But think about the shock and or the horror. People who have been accustomed to buying anything, going to any grocery store and having umpteen steaks in all the, the, the meat counters. I mean, you realize that, that the way we shop and the, what we have in America is not typically true of a lot of cities around the globe and around the world. Uh, that was one of the things that marveled us when we used to have the, uh, the singers. Our art art singers. I couldn't think of their name. I stuck there and only think of their country. And uh, and they would go in a grocery store or shoe shops. When they, when they first went in a shoe shop with Harold down in Lynchburg, Virginia, because Harold was going to buy them all shoes. When they first, when he took them in to buy a pair of shoes for each one of them, they just were mesmerized. They were shocked. They had never seen anything. I'm, I'm serious. you got to understand, these guys live in a big city. All right? Their houses and their homes and their church is in a fairly large city that's been completely eradicated, by the way, uh, where they live, okay? Because in Russia, you don't have those kinds of things. They don't see that kind of excess and even certainly waste. Those guys don't believe in waste, trust me. They use everything to the, to the inch. We, we, we've grown up, I hate to say this, but we are. We're all sorry brats. Because we got everything. And we don't even appreciate what we sometimes have. Think about it. Do we not? Right. Is anybody here going to here food line going to find all the shelves empty? Or even one place half full? No, you don't. Yeah, it may come one day. But we are so spoiled. Okay? And uh, it's sort of sad that we have become the nation of being spoiled rotten to a certain degree. But anyway, so you got to understand, when you read your Bible and you hear that they were in total reproach, what does that mean? It means other people outside, even their enemies, felt sorry for them. Well, they had squat. They didn't have anything. And so Nehemiah is putting it all together in his mind, and, and God, the Holy Spirit, then would come on him, not in him, would, would got him so burdened, so burdened down, that it affected his countenance horribly before the king. But can I tell you, again, the timing, isn't it interesting? He just gets word. Just before going into the presence of the king. And through the countenance change that broke his heart is what led to him going back, literally, and rebuilding the walls. Check it out. It's exactly how it happened. Suppose if he had never had a changed countenance. Suppose if God had never burdened his heart and he was insensitive about his people, insensitive of the condition of the state of Jerusalem. What then? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But he was moved. A little bit like Jesus when he saw the walls in the city of Jerusalem. And it talks about, oh, Jerusalem, Judah, how? I would have gathered thee as a chick, gathered her chicks, but ye would not, Jesus said. So burdened, so concerned for his people. Does Paul not say the same thing? Sure he does. He says over um, uh, man, I used to have all these verses memorized and man, anybody had the same problem? I, 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 be, I forget the address uh, the addresses. I still remember the scripture, which is the most important part. But I forget sometimes the address. See what I'm talking about? The, the chapter verse and that kind of thing. But uh, uh, how he on one occasion said that he would be willing basically to perish and go to hell. For the sake of his brother, his people. It said Romans, I think. Was it? No, or Corinthians. One of those two books, anyway. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When he said that? Some of you nod your head. Remember reading it sometime or another. Me too, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, they were burdened. Burdened for their people. Just as we are burdened about our people. About our nation. And we well ought to be. So, instead of being a distinguished nation now, they are totally disgraced people and a disgraced nation. Now, let me apply this in everyday terms today. When you read this, what led to everything devastated and destroyed in Jerusalem? Anybody know what led to that? Any guesses? The same thing it always was. A little three-letter word. 
What? I heard it, I thought. Yeah. Sin caused the Babylonians to invade them. Sin it was always their problem. What sin? Well, sins are the results and the fruit of the greatest sin, which is never allowing God to have the right place in your life. Did you hear me? That's it in a nutshell. They refuse God time and time again. I mean, I don't care what. Did he think about it? They no sooner get out of Egypt. They saw his hand. They've taken the spoil for all the years they've been in captivity. And the Bible distinctly says, man, they got gold, they got silver, they got goods. And here they are, traipsing across. And going to a land God's promised them. What do they do? No sooner they get out of there. They don't, what do they do? They make false gods. Remember the calf? They were really ready to turn. When they had any pain, sorrow, any problem, any difficulty on their journey, did they not always question God and fuss about Moses? Had you not done this? Had God not led you to do this? We'd be a lot better eating leeks, onions, and all the other garbage that they said they ate back then. All right? You didn't have to see a Jew coming. You could smell them down a mile away. But anyway, having said that, is that not really sometimes our problem? Are you aware that all around in America, the reason America is where she is today, and I think I'm can you slide it personally, is because of sin? Sin has long, long ago, by the way, this is in the church, has completely lost, as Paul called it, its exceedingly sinfulness. Lost, it's gone. Anybody here really shocked by any sin today? If you'd have told me, my, we, were, we were watching a Christian faith, faith, faith film just the other night. And I'm sitting there, and of course, because it is a Ruku and it's uh, it's it's uh, pure faith station. And uh, we're watching this good movie, by the way. Good. And it, boy, you saved it. They didn't use the term saved it. That is what happened to them. Uh, they just said, oh, I prayed <laughs> and got changed. But anyway, and that is what happened. But anyway, here I'm watching this movie. Great. Involved in it. Loved it. I think it's great, the whole message in that particular movie. And in my office, God, to put that movie on, if it's not drugs, the pharmacy, pharma kind of people putting their, out there a little crazy thing, it's women's underwear. Did any woman ever dream women would prance around worse than most men see in the bedroom? Think about that. I mean, I can't believe it. And then they, then they, then they got the depends one. Have I seen the depends one? I'm sitting there. Who wants to see this garbage? Why in the world? But you see, because nobody really has bucked it, and they really don't. Just like movies. Why? Why do you think movies got raunchier and raunchier? Because they sold. People continue to buy and go, give them their money, and nobody had a revolt. Liquor got in Decatur because only a handful of us preachers fought it. And the majority of churches, sad to say, then even, wanted it. Jill told me Sunday after church, long time after church, pretty long, pretty long after church, she said, you know what you're preaching today? She said, let me tell you about a preacher in town. And I happen to know who she's talking about. Don't know him personally. Uh, and it's a Baptist church. She said, hey, uh, just found out, I guess, a few weeks ago, I think is what you told me. Some of her cohorts, are they cohorts of the past or present? You don't run around with people that would be in a place doing what they were doing, right? You wouldn't, would they, you? They were eating. Oh, that's right. It was a bar. It was, the, it was getting drinks in the, in the restaurant. Okay. The pastor and family in it. Drink it. And he's in a pretty good sized church in town, by the way. Okay? I'm telling you, it's everywhere. Blows my ever loving mind. And here's what blows my mind even more. That nobody inside churches says a thing. Cares. Does that make sense? They kind of know that. I mean, it's a public facility. If, if the, if, I'm not saying they're on God, I don't know who told you, and nor do I care. But if those people who came to her with that, you know, and because she's a Christian and they're not, and they're, they're throwing dirt or whatever, I don't know what the purpose of the motive, don't really care. But you got to understand, does, do you not see that hurting all of us? 
that hurts that hurts me. So that when I go to witness to people like that, hey, hey, you know, wait a minute, preacher, you know better than I am. I, I know a preacher that drinks. Uh, he drinks with us, or he comes to the same bar or the same tavern or same restaurant I get my cocktails from. You understand know what I'm saying? And it's everywhere. When I do mean everywhere. Our preachers that are loose in their preaching and their tongues when they preach and say certainly things that have no place in a pulpit. But here's what I was preaching on. Why, not, why is all this happening? And why is it more rapidly declining? Because sin is no longer sin. It's excused. It's tolerated. And, and the way they do it is gradually, isn't it? Isn't that how homosexuality came into America? Sure it did. I remember the first time I saw two men living together on TV. Odd couple. Remember that? I said, that just Two men living in the same room together. And, I, and I'm not saying I thought of that, but I thought, hey, I don't want to live with no man anytime, any place. Okay? So it's it's a gradual thing. So that's exactly what the problem was with the city of Jerusalem and why the people were suffering. By the way, anytime you or I or anybody thinks they can live without God, or walks away from God, it'll always cost us something. And did it cost the people of Jerusalem? Sure it did. They ended up going into seven-year captivity. Okay? Every time you turn around, weren't they in captivity? Only time they haven't been in captivity or bondage to someone or another was May 14, 1948. That's when it stopped. That's the only time it stopped. And in a sense, though they, it, they are their own nation now since then, uh, it has long ago, they still suffer, do they not? All around them are their foes and their enemies, and they want nothing more than to destroy and eradicate them from off the face of the earth. Why? Because they walked a long time ago away from God. They refused to believe in the Messiah, and they had truly, truly suffered horribly, horribly. Does sin bother you? I, I was thinking today. Uh, when I was in Chicago, southwest Chicago, had a bus route for Hiles Anderson and for First Baptist of Hammond. Uh, you have no idea what you saw. I, I, you got to understand, it, it, even as wicked I, as I was in Madison Heights as a young man, and I'm not proud of it, I'm just saying, even as much I would never have thought shocked me, Pete, when I got to Chicago working bus routes, I got floored by a lot of things. I'm serious. I can tell you horror stories. But I will say this, there was never a side of me going down South Kedzie Street filled with bar rooms and taverns everywhere. That was something I wasn't used to. You know, Most of our taverns are hidden somewhere in a restaurant. <laughs> I mean, really, really, in the South. You, you, you go to North, I was shocked the first time I went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I was shocked when I first moved to the big city of Jacksonville. And uh, I never did understand why they took me down to prostitute town. I never understood that. But, uh, I mean, here we are. And they wanted, to, I mean, they wanted to show me how wicked Jacksonville was. And, uh, and brother, it was. Trust me. I mean, street walkers and everything. We didn't stay down. I'm not meaning that. Drive through and out of there. But, I mean, you just, man, unless you've been to some of these it's shocking. For example, never on a Saturday visitation. Was I not disturbed, bothered, and burdened? You know what bo bothered me and burdened me? Number one, little kids I was visiting. Precious little kids. I saw a, ki I saw a family of six kids got, I, I, on, in a high tenement uh, building. And I'm telling you, as God's my way, I still don't know how he did it. He laughed at me when I asked him. But head zero went into the apartment. They, the, the father invited me in that Saturday morning when I first met the kids. They wanted to come to church. We, we had some toys and things we'd give away, some little trinkets and so forth. And they said, well, talk to my dad, talk to my dad. So we went up these, these stairs, okay? And if they had an elevator, I wasn't on it. I walked all these stairs all this time. And when I got up there and I went through that, in that apartment, I was shocked. I'm just telling you, there was nothing in that apartment but an apartment. A little bit of heat on, okay? Getting cold already. Children didn't even have shoes on. I'm telling you the truth. It was already cold outside in Chicago. And I started asking Dad, and while I was in it, he said, come here, I want to show you something. We went into another room. Not a stitch of furniture. 
The kids slept together on two mattresses on the floor. Okay? That's all they had. That's where they slept. He told me. He said, that's their bed. But let me tell you what he did have. He had the neatest, most super painted hall you ever seen sitting in the middle of one of his rooms. That's what he took me in there to show you. Anybody know what a hall is? You know what a hall is. <laughs> Harley Davidson. I mean, I'm talking about with the big bars all chrome. You would have been proud if you'd seen that body, even back in that day. And he's got it in his kind of, I call it a living room, den, whatever it was. And yet he didn't have a stitch filled furniture. So I asked him, I said, How'd you get that up? He said, I got ways. I said, Man, that's a good looking body. And he didn't have squat. And the kids didn't even have shoes. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Isn't that sad? Don't that break your heart? Don't that bother you? Yeah. And when you see it, and it was nothing, as, as God's my witness, on South Kedzie, you had to dodge, and I'm not exaggerating, because there's so many bars on South Kedzie. You gotta understand, with those bars, they have a bar, but they have a tenement house. Okay? And you have side entrances to get some of these tenement houses. Hey, as God's my witness, Roman Catholic Church on South Kedzie had its own bar room. Catholic Church. Back in that day. I know what I'm talking about. I saw it. Okay. Kids said, oh, yeah, my, my daddy goes to Catholic Church to drink. What? He goes to Catholic Church to drink? Where in the world is he drinking? Oh, I'll show you. And they did. It's all my own eyes. They had a bar right there in the church. Okay, and I'm saying, you know, Cathedral Park, where they, whatever they do, oh, uh, whatever it is. They do. Do you understand what I'm saying, church? That was in the 70s, early 70s, by the way. So, anyway. Uh, some sad things. I like a passage of scripture. I can't remember. Uh, it says this. For my eyes affecteth my heart. Okay? I can't remember who said that though. It's not to be called right now. But in reading I underlined it one day and I said, boy, that preach right there. Because when we look at this world, and we see the ungodliness, as well as sinners going to hell. Let me share with you a quick statistic. I, I pulled up, you know, I'm a statistic freak, and, I, and, I, and I'm a searcher for stuff. So he's concerned about the people, but then he's concerned also about the place. He is in ruins. He hears that the walls have been destroyed, and the whole city is in shambles, okay? So that moved his heart. So he was concerned, first about his people, the Jews. And then secondly, he, he had a broken heart because he was concerned and broken over a city called Jerusalem. Look, look at verse 3, part B. And the wall of Jerusalem was also broken down, and the gates thereof had been burned with fire. Over in Isaiah chapter 60, and again, I was read, I'm reiterating a little bit of what I said earlier. Whenever you read about Jerusalem, it's interesting to me, they always will talk about two things about the city. They'll talk about the gates and a lot of passages, and they'll always talk about its walls. Okay? And uh, in Isaiah 60, maybe this is why, the Bible distinctly says in Isaiah chapter 60 that the gates speak of praise over the city and the walls are symbolized as salvation. Why? Because walls are secure. And I don't know about you, I'm secure in my salvation and my Jesus. Amen. And so it makes for a good parallel. But now, because it's all been destroyed, they have no praise. They have no salvation as far as their concern of security with God any longer. These people are devoid of both those things. Do you not see the same thing where you work, where we travel, where we go? People everywhere are lost. People everywhere dying, going to the devil's hell. I was curious. I, I had a lot of old stats and stuff I, I knew about through preaching over the years, but I knew they weren't up to date. So today, I just was curious. How many people die a day? All right? And uh, so I, I, I did a search. And on my search, this is what I discovered. In 2023, reported in the world, 61 million people died. Okay? Over 61 million people died. That's a lot of people. Is that true? And many did come from America, but many came from India, China, and so forth. And here's, the, here, here's where I'm going. The 61 million deaths around the globe. And by the way, we are not gaining any ground in this year anymore. During the 60s, 70s, Pete, I know for a fact, we were gaining, gaining ground in reaching people. 
but the world is growing at a faster pace than the church today is evangelizing them. Okay? 60 million people died, and that's around the globe. Think about China. Not that many Christians there. They have Christians. But out of that, how many percentage maybe have went to hell? Many who maybe never one time had an absolute, real clear presentation of the gospel. Now, 61 million calculates out if you divide it by 365 days to let you know I do know how to do some math. Not much, but a little bit. That comes to a total of 167,123 people perish and go majority-wise to hell. Think about that. A lot of people. A lot of souls. So while I was doing that, I got another thing into my brain. And I thought, let me, let me, let me look up fairly large city closest to us. Not the year. I couldn't find any stats on where our stands. I tried, but I couldn't find it. But I did find one that all of us know about. And you try you travel through every time all of us have here on eighty one through the through the Roanoke Valley. City of Roanoke now has a total of ninety seven thousand and some people, okay? Population. So while I thought about the population, I want to know, well, it's grown over the years because I remember when it was probably like Lynchburg. Lynchburg was in the 40s and they were in the 60s back in my day when I was running around and probably when Diane was student teaching at one of the schools there. But out of 97,000, get this, I looked up this statistic out of curiosity and it's the only city I could find that gave me these stats. And they are this. How many churches do you think is in Rona? Just the city limits, not outside. Doesn't count the county. This is strictly the city of Rona and how it takes in. How many churches would you think in that area? Actually, according to online, 500 churches. That's a lot of churches. Can I tell you how much so? In other words, if all those churches could get the entire town in church, each church would only have 194 people. You understand what I'm saying? To me, that mesmerizes that's something I, I'm interested in those kind of things. But what does it mean? They, they are enough churches there, but we don't have the right kind to really impact them. The city of them in all probability. By the way, few far between churches there, uh, like we preach Sunday. But anyway, let me close with this. I got two more points. Hopefully, I'll get to them all again, maybe next week. Uh, a man was walking on the seashore one day and he was bending over, picking up things. And someone that happened to be curious about his bending over and every now and then he'd go out and do something in the water. But from a distance, he couldn't tell what he's doing. He thought, well, why is he shell looking? And why, would he, why does he throw it out every once in a blue moon and stumping back out the ocean? And so he walked up to the gentleman and said, sir, if you don't mind me asking, I'm not trying to interrupt, I'm not trying to be nosy, but I just couldn't help but observe. You'll come up here, you'll look. And of course, the shore was filled. By the way, there's certain seasons these things do happen on. And some of you may know that. It's from the beaches and things. Anybody here ever been down there when it's been red tide? Anybody ever gone through red tide? Oh, my soul. I've gone there two times. And when I had a whole week to stay down there. I mean, you can't go outside. Your eyes burn. Your nose burns. You can't breathe. It's horrible. But anyway, remember, remember, remember those times when we had to... The, the condos down there, but anyhow. Uh, so he asked the gentleman, what are you doing? Why do you keep bending over and you're going back out toward the ocean? And he reached over and he picked up a starfish, still wiggling very much. I've seen him that way early in the morning. And picked up a little starfish and he said, you see this little fella? If he stays here, he won't make it. The son will cook and he'll die. And what you're seeing, you're going down and putting him back in the water so he has a chance to live. But the guy sort of made a mockery of it. But, uh, what difference does that make? You really think you're making a difference? And he turned around and he said, Sir, it did make a difference to that. Think about it. Don't ever think. Uh, Ann and I were talking uh, last night at the table about soul winning and, and people she witnesses to and some experiences she's had in, in soul winning and witnessing crazy things. And uh, I gave her one that happened when I was in Alabama that was pretty sensational, but I won't go into it tonight. But we were talking about how you never know. She said just, what was it, just this week or maybe last week, something that's been very recent. She said, I can't tell you why I did 
we were, we were, I don't know if she was in a parking lot or where she was. She didn't give me all the details. She said, I rolled down my window when I seen it. And be, I'm just being honest with you. I just quoted it over and over again. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, who shall believe in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Did it again. Did it again. Did it again. And then we just drove off. I had no idea. I said, you don't need to know. If you felt impressed to do that, it probably was a God thing. God may have already started dealing with this man about the gospel, and God's reminding him, this is how much I care about your soul, that I've sent somebody to pull up beside you and give you the word of God. Years ago, I told a story. I said, it's a strange habit. But a, a man was walking by the seashore. This is overseas. And he'd been neglecting and rejecting every offer God made to him about the gospel. He had already been presented the gospel several times. Refused. Every time someone talked to him about Jesus. I'm not interested. He's walking on the seashore overseas. And according to the story, he reached out. He saw something coming up on the shore rolling. He thought, oh, that's interesting. What is that thing? So he walked toward it. It was like a genie glass, kind of a, uh, a glass thing with a top on it, wet, wet. But inside, he saw a piece of paper. He thought, what in the world? Where'd that come from? And when he opened it up, the gospel in miniature was in that container. One more time to tell him how he needed Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. And because of that, he said to himself, if God has so followed me here with this kind of a circumstance, how can I do any less than trust him and his son? I think I would too. Amen? That's what you call uh, the, 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 the dog being on the rabbit trail. God was following him even there to try to tell him his need of Jesus Christ. Hey, they're everywhere, folks. Everywhere we go. Every waiter you'll talk to. Every waitress, waitress that comes to your table. Everybody just needs and they certainly need an opportunity to hear about our Savior. Amen? All right. Let me give you some quick uh, things tonight to pray for. Cindy Boats. Uh, by the way, she asked me after. No, she, she called.